Thank you. I uh, have that water in my pocket. I'm not saying Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. Uh, I know. Well, I'm going to start by reading something. Sunday, December 13, 1863. Weather rainy. I went to Dr. Pettis and had my pet, parenthetical, the swelling in the pit of my right arm examined. He said it was not ready to be lanced. I also got a prescription uh, to get some uh, cough medicine in a bottle. I've been annoyed by, for several, uh, for, by a severe cough for several nights. I went to the drugstore and the clerk gave me about two inches of a stick of licorice. He told me that would be just as good. <laughs> That was uh, from a diarist, Curtis R. Burke, member of the 14th Kentucky Cavalry and a prisoner at Camp Douglas from August 1863 until March of 1865. Uh, just a little example around this time of year of what was going on there. He had a call. First, I want to introduce uh, someone sitting over here, Dean Rodkin, who's a member of the Board of Directors of the Camp Douglas Restoration Foundation, and uh, she's the one that keeps all of us straight. In the <laughs> so I want to thank Dean for coming to uh, sort of hold my hand tonight. Before I talk about Camp Douglas, I want to talk a little bit about some facts, a little military facts about all You probably know all of these, but just to sort of get us in the mood. What I find interesting, 58% of the 19, 1860 military age men served in the Civil War. And that's compared to 42% in New York and 41% in Massachusetts. And you can see Illinois was very well, well represented. <coughs> we ranked only behind New York, Massachusetts, and Ohio in providing men for the war. And of course, those states were much larger than ours. 35,000 Illinois soldiers died, ranking third. Illinois soldiers fought in every theater of the Civil War. We always think of this as a Western theater primarily, but we had units at Gettysburg, we had units at Chickamauga. You name a, a battle and a battle area, and you'll find Illinois soldiers very well represented. Um, where did they come from? This is a busy slide today. You know, I'm an ex banker, so I have to have at least one slide with a lot of numbers. Uh, this really shows the call for volunteers by Abraham Lincoln. You'll notice through the course of the, of the war, 225,000 a little over were called, were asked to be provided. Uh, Illinois provided about 231,000. Did not have to depend on a draft. Now that's a little bit of a lie because uh, you, if you remember, you could uh, buy your way out of uh, serving uh, for a few hundred bucks, but technically no one was drafted from Illinois. It was covered by volunteers or paid soldiers. Again, I think an indication of the commitment made by the state of Illinois. And look at the population of the state. Uh, Roughly a million six or a million seven, and you notice that huge growth between 1860 and 1870, primarily Chicago, which was the fastest growing city in the, in the country at the time. I also find this interesting some of the uh, ethnic uh, representation about 18,000 Germans, about 12,000 Irish, and roughly 2,000 African Americans from Illinois served. Many of the African Americans, as I think you probably know, didn't serve in Illinois units since Illinois was a little slow in recruiting uh, the colored troops, so many of them went to Massachusetts and in New York. But an interesting group. Now, it wasn't all barren skittles in getting these troops, and there's one interesting story I find fascinating. And responding to a request by a Chicago Tribune publisher, uh, Joseph Medill, who wanted a reduction in the call, the last call uh, for the uh, for troops. And the position taken by Medill and his 
two other guys who weren't even authorized, was that Cook County and Chicago had been undercounted. So we didn't need to provide the 6,000 people it was asked. And I find this quote from Abraham Lincoln interesting. Here's what he said. Gentlemen, after Boston, Chicago has been the chief instrument in bringing this war on the country. The Northwest has opposed the South and the, and, as the Northeast has opposed the South. It is you who are largely responsible for making the blood flow as it has. You called for war until you had it. You called for emancipation, and I have given it to you. Whatever you've asked for, you have had. Now you come here begging to be let off the call for men, which I have made to carry out the war you have demanded. You, should, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. I have a right to expect better of you. Go home and raise those men. And the deal, this is what he ended up with, and the deal, you were acting like a coward. You and your tribune had more influence than any paper in the Northwest in making the war. You can influence great masses and yet carry out, to cry to be spared at the moment the cause of suffering. Go home and give me those men. They walked out of the room and one of the other would say, you know, the old man's right. Uh, let's not ever talk about this. They went home and gave them but I think an interesting story that sort of sets the tone for uh, talking about Camp Douglas. I also want to talk a little bit about Chicago. And those last two numbers are what's interesting. You'll notice Chicago virtually tripled in size in the, the decade of the Civil War. I submit, and I really believe this, and I can show you statistically, which you don't want to see, that Chicago's broad shoulders were obtained on the shoulders of the Civil War. The growth in Chicago in commerce and banking, you name it, was on the heels of the Civil War. Uh, so we can't forget how important it was to this, the growth of our city. How much to know about Camp Douglas? Well, on your table, and I, I won't, uh, I'll just put these off, I put together 10 questions. Hopefully I'll be able to answer these in the course of this presentation, and not at the end I have the answer. Uh, and forgive me, there are no prizes. So I uh, but there are 10 questions. If you, if you haven't got a copy, uh, do them up. And I will argue with anybody on the answer. Actually, she could get past the question. Let's talk about Camp Douglas. Where was Camp Douglas? The northern boundary of Camp Douglas was 31st Street in Chicago. The eastern boundary was Cottage Grove Avenue. The southern boundary, 35th Place, 33rd Place, I'm sorry. And the eastern boundary was Cottage Grove. Cottage Grove was kind of interesting because that was a modern, a modern road. Actually, macadamized, is that the right word? I mean, it was blacktop, sort of. And it ran from downtown Chicago to the town of Hyde Park. It also had a horse drawn trolley on it uh, that has some interesting stories relating to Camp Douglas and both the Union and the Confederate soldiers using it to go downtown to have some fun. Uh, the Confederate prisoners, for some reason, we'll talk later about that, like to go downtown and get drunk. And then come back or else get sent back. Um, today, what's there today? This area, basically from King Drive, is, is owned, and I, I say this every time I give a talk, and I, I do not apologize for it, that is owned or controlled by the real estate development firm of Draper and Kramer, who are probably some of the worst citizens in the world. When we tried to talk to them just to tell them what we were doing, their response to us, we don't care what you're doing and don't ever call us again. Other than that, they're nice folks. <laughs> uh, the area between King Drive and Giles Avenue, is that focused? Yeah. Can you see that? I got this from my angle. I thought it was focused, but you can see that fine. Um, that is a mixed use. There's single family residence. In fact, there's some Frank Lloyd Wright uh, townhouses there. Uh, 
uh, a school and some other things. So it's mixed use. So, and as you probably know, there is absolutely nothing uh, left of the campus. So, um, this is uh, the camp superimposed on uh, a modern Google map, and that the drawing of the camp is interesting. That was done by the Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, they took data that we had and created a virtual map of, this, of Camp Douglas. One of the controversies has been where the western boundary is. Uh, many people thought it was King Drive. Uh, we said it was Giles Avenue. Ironically, when IIT finished their drawing, we laid it on Google Map. We knew the eastern side of it, and when we laid it down, it was really amazing. It fell exactly on Giles Avenue. So, of course, we were right. <laughs> so, but it's also interesting, we've also confirmed it by some of our archaeological digs, which I'll talk a little bit more later, where we found evidence of the camp where people said the camp wasn't. Um, and also, interestingly, uh, if you take 60 acres, which was pretty much given the size of it, if you, if you draw that out, 60 acres, you have to include the area over at Giles Avenue, otherwise it's only about 45 acres. And finally, the Douglas estate put a claim in, oh, that's part of it here, put a claim in uh, for re reimbursement for use of their land. And interesting, they gave a, they put a plat in included, this was in 1865. They had a plat of the area, which among other things showed where the uh, where the uh, smallpox victims were buried in the Jewel parking lot down there. Uh, and they drew a line that ended up being the fence line. Of, it was really a reproduction of the fence line, which showed would have showed Giles Avenue. So, and incidentally, none of the camp was on Douglas's land of the camp proper. He received credit for five acres that was on the uh, smallpox hospital, but that was technically off the, uh, the camp itself. Um, what did the camp look like? The camp really had four distinct parts. Uh, number one was Garrison Square, this area, which is where the Garrison stayed. Why were these Americans in their title? <laughs> the second was White Oak Square. Uh, that's an interesting area because not only did Union soldiers stay there, but when the first prisoners were there, they stayed there in the same barracks as their, as their guards. It sort of shared barracks so that a little bit uh, helped bribery was a little easier in those days. This area here on this map, 1865 map, uh, is called South Square, sometimes called Hospital Square. That's where a hospital for the Union soldiers and a hospital for the Confederates were located. Also, their logistics. They had a sawmill in there and a quartermaster facility. This area, uh, beginning in early 1864, consisted of 66 barracks that were constructed specifically to hold the prisoners. Um, there had been barracks sort of in this configuration around the area prior to 1864, but they constructed new barriers. And that's an interesting point about Camp Douglas. Many people have said, if you read books about prison camps, that they never tried to improve the camps. Well, camp Douglas was improved over the time. Now that we'll talk a little bit more about how far behind they got, but they, these were barracks that were built specifically for it. A sewer system was built while the prisoners were there, and water facilities were significantly increased, both in terms of the number of, uh, of hydrants that brought water in, but it went from a three-inch water pipe to a six-inch. So there were some improvements made, a little bit too little and too late, uh, but there were improvements. What's interesting is this little square here, little cutout. Uh, most of the property, about 35 of the 60 acres, came from, from a gentleman by the name of Graves. Mrs. Graves refused to move. So they built the camp around us. Now, if I'm ever fortunate enough to either to meet any record of Civil War II people, I want to meet Abraham Lincoln, of course, and Mrs. Graves. <laughs> because I want to ask her, you had about 70,000 people in your backyard 
I don't know how many thousand horses. There was virtually no sanitation. Are you glad you stayed? <laughs> I can find no evidence of her after, although I know her house was in existence, though I have a photo of it from uh, 1905, but I can't find any comments from Mrs. Graves whether she liked it or not. Um, some of the information which I think is, is interesting here is we have we have a lot of stuff available on campus. Uh, much too much of it is at the Abraham Lincoln bookstore and the prices are outrageous. <laughs> uh, but photographs, etchings, uh, actually maps that have been drawn. So we have a lot of information that, that helps us understand it. Uh, the, the history of the camp uh, it opened in September 1861. Now, uh, there was a lease entered into in 1861 between the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago. And that lease said that you're going you're to give this land to the military. And uh, you're going to provide water. You'll return it to the owners in the same condition it was in. And you'll give them free rides, any military free rides, on the, uh, on the omnibus. Now, the interesting thing was, the camp wasn't in Chicago. The city members of Chicago stopped at 31st Street. So they entered into a lease for land they had no right to enter into. Uh, now, uh, they, did, uh, they did provide the water, and that was part of it. And the omnibus, I was talking to the, the guy who wrote, who wrote a wonderful book on, uh, on transportation here about cable cars. And it's been a tradition in Chicago to, for military to ride free. And when I gave him a copy of the lease, he said this was the oldest reference he could find to free military rides. So the city did license those omnibuses, so it's very possible that they, had, they could control them. Just kind of an interesting story. Opened in 1861, the purpose of the camp was to provide a a, a mustard facility for your troops entering the military from the northern third of Illinois. Uh, basically Cook County to the Wisconsin line, Lake Michigan to the Mississippi River. Uh, governor Gates, uh, who's the governor, split the state into three districts. This was the northern district. Approximately 40,000 Union soldiers mustered in, in Camp Douglas. We think of it as a prison camp, but it was more than that. It was a huge mustering insight for the military. Um, it was selected, and this never happens in Illinois, it was selected by a politician, <laughs> Judge Fuller, and actually had, uh, had a military person looked at the site, it probably never would have existed. It was clay and sand, poor drainage, unbroken wind off Lake Michigan, uh, a really not a very good place to have folks living. Union or Confederate, but Fuller chose it. He later was named the Adjutant General of Illinois with no military experience. Uh, opened in 1861. First prisoners arrived in February of 1862. Talk a little bit more about that a little later, but uh, basically the when it was realized they were going to have to hold some prisoners that were looking for a place to put them. And Chicago became a very logical place. Um, why, why was Chicago a logical place? There three criteria, really. Criteria number one, you needed to be far enough away from the fighting that you couldn't have a raid to release prisoners. Two, it needed to be on good transportation. Can you spell Illinois Central Railroad? coming from Cairo, or the St. Louis, Alton, Chicago Railroad coming from St. Louis, so you can take them by boat to either of those and readily get them into the city. The Illinois Central was such an important uh, transportation hub that there was a, a station put at Camp Douglas. So all they had to do was walk 400 yards to the front gate. Uh, Alton Railroad, they were on Archer Avenue, Instead of going downtown, they let them off at Archer Avenue. It was about a two-mile march over there instead of four miles from downtown. But they stop on Archer Avenue, throw, get the prisoners off, and walk them to uh, 
they can't talk to us. Uh, first prisoners uh, were here came from uh, uh, Fort Donaldson. The capture of Fort Donaldson. Uh, the mayor wrote General Halleck and said, "We can't accept them. We, we don't. We, we, we don't know what to do with them." Well, General Halleck said, "That's your problem because I don't have anybody to to send to guard them." And ended up, the first prisoners at Camp Douglas were guarded by the police and some uh, constabulary police that were auxiliary police that were called in to guard the prisoners for a short time. Most of the prisoners didn't want to go anywhere anyway at that point. You know, they just wanted to take a little nap. So, uh, uh, first prisoners there. It operated until December 1865. Most of the prisoners left by July of 1865. Only those who were very ill remained until roughly December. Um, and by the end of December, the camp was gone. And I underscore gone. 200 buildings, gone, in less than a month. Now, none of them were permanent, they were built on the ground. Only the headquarters building, we believe, had a foundation, the rest were just built on the ground. But in a very short time, evidence of the camp was absolutely wiped out. And here are a couple of, three pictures of the camp. One of the one on the upper right are, uh, are Confederate enlisted soldiers. And the buildings you can see behind them are where the barracks that they lived in, the wooden barracks, were 90 feet long. The middle one, the lower middle one's an interesting photograph. This is captioned Fort Donaldson, so they apparently Fort Donaldson prisoners. They happen to be wearing Union top coats, overcoats. If you look at the button configuration and then actually the collar, they were Union. One of the criticisms of all the camps was they never provided any clothing. I find two things interesting. I've yet to find a photograph, what were they staged, I don't know, where the prisoners weren't clothed. Now, I'm not going to say they were well clothed, but there was no rags that you can never see in photographs. This one, you know, the, the Senate would say that gave them the coats, took the picture for propaganda, and took it away from them. I don't know. Well, I know five people got coat. The picture on the left, uh, Morgan's Raiders, we'll talk about in a minute. They're, uh, they're some of my favorites. Uh, camp Douglas was not the only prison camp in, in Illinois. Illinois actually had, uh, had almost more than anyone else. Rock Island, we had a prison camp there from 1863 to 1865. Had about 10,000 people at it. In the course of about 2,000 died. Camp Butler in Springfield operated a fairly short period of time, 1863, only held a couple thousand. Alton Prison was a prison and was also handled prisoners from 1862 to 1865, off and on, not a large number of them. Uh, quickly summarize some of the facts we talked about. It was 60 acres in size, about 40,000 Union troops trained there. It was one of eight Union places where African American soldiers were trained or received. And that's a little bit of a misnomer. Let me clarify. When recruiting started, they were recruiting by regiment or a thousand soldiers. Uh, that, was, that was the basic recruiting unit, that was a basic maneuver unit. So they trained, they mustered in and trained there. As the war wore on and you were getting replacements, it was a company or it was individuals, which meant they would go through a place like Camp Douglas pretty quick. For example, the 29th uh, U.S. Colored Troops technically mustered in in Peoria, and yet Chicago troops were, came through Chicago. Now, what did they get? Signed some papers. Maybe got a uniform. Probably didn't get a weapon, but they got a ticket to sell. So that was sort of the way that that, that worked as the war wore on. Uh, it was one of the longest operating prisons in the Union system. Uh, and it had, unfortunately, the greatest number of deaths of any Union prison. However, it didn't have, it wasn't the uh, greatest death mortality rate. Elmira, New York, had that distinction of about 
Camp Douglas's mortality rate was somewhere between 15 and 17 percent. We don't know how many prisoners were there for sure, but the estimates are somewhere 15 to 17. Slightly higher than the National Union have Union, which was about 12 percent of Confederate soldiers died in Union prison camps. About 17 percent of Union soldiers died in Confederate prison camps. So that's sort of the way the numbers shake out. Um, contains, I mentioned, 200 buildings, 66 were barracks. Held a total of about 30,000 prisoners over the course of the, of the time. The most held at one time was a little over 12,000. And this is the statistic that's used in determining how the biggest prisons. Because what would happen, you'd have people coming and going, so it's very difficult. So once in a while, they have a muster where they list them all. And the 12,000 uh, actually placed Camp Douglas third among Union prison camps based on that 12,000 number. Although it was said that uh, Fort Delaware, who was second, probably had less total, but who's arguing? Uh, 12,000, the camp was rated for about 9,000. You guys can do the math as well as I can. At 9,000, it was two people per bunk. You can figure out what it comes out to for 12. Uh, documented deaths due to disease, a little over 4,000. We'll talk about that in a minute. Total prisoners' death, I, esti I estimated 5,000. Some people say as high as seven. I think seven is over the top. I think between five and six is probably a realistic number. Um, Maybe I think you know George Levy who wrote another book on Camp Douglas called To Die in Chicago. George and I have compared notes. We, and one of the things you talk about is a conspiracy, you know, to kill all these folks. So the deaths of 4,000 by disease, and they shot the rest of them. All the work we've done, we can document 25 killings by guards uh, at Camp Douglas based on hospital reports based on diaries, drawers, about 25, of which half of them people were trying to escape. Now, does that constitute a conspiracy to murder the prisoners? I find that a little hard to justify. Not to say the conditions were good there, because they weren't. Not to say that they didn't, didn't get adequate food. They didn't often. But I don't think there was a conspiracy to murder them any more than there was a conspiracy among the Confederates to murder Union uh, prisoners. We didn't argue that. Well, it's been a little time to talk about the reason for the loss of life. <laughs> and this is applicable not only to Camp Douglas, I think you have to look at this uh, as a problem throughout the Civil War. First of all, there was no history of incarceration until the Civil War. This, a lot of people don't realize this. Prior to the Civil War, if you were captured, and I, I submit that the word prisoner of war that wasn't applicable until the Civil War. But if you were captured, one of the following happened to you. You were killed. We'll only get rid of them. Number two, uh, you would be sold into slavery. It was very common for the European wars. And if you were wealthy enough, probably an officer, you were ransomed. Or more so because of the gentlemanly nature of war, you were paroled. You signed an agreement not to fight until you were properly exchanged for a soldier from the other side of equal rank. You just went home, or you went somewhere. Uh, so that sort of precluded or, or just eliminated the need to have prison camps. If you look at the prison camps in the history of the United States, you had some young people who say, oh, remember those ships in New York Harbor, those terrible prison ships? Well, most of those people were either privateers or political prisoners. They really weren't soldiers. Most of the soldiers were paroled. Uh, during the Revolutionary War, British officers were paroled in place wherever they were captured, and then they were on their own, including their own bucks. So they, they actually lived among the civilians uh, on their own dollar or pound. And 
until they were properly exchanged. That was very common. So this lack of history sort of set the tone for what happened during the Civil War. That led to poor training. A good example of a commander of Camp Douglas would be something like this. Colonel, you have a regiment here. You're, you are mustering in a regiment. By the way, you're also commanding the prison camp. That's how much training he got. Didn't have a clue what to do. All he knew was, of course, he wasn't very experienced. He knew that his soldiers generally slaughtered and did what he was told. And these prisoners were telling him to go ahead. So, didn't have a problem. Same thing with the guards. The guards would something like this. You're a guard. No. And I've got some requests from the commanders to companies around the area, 75 people for guard duty. Well, guard, you got a guard. See, those, those are prisoners over there. They don't do it much either. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you, your, your musket has been condemned. So it might blow up in your face. Now, we're going to get you a pistol to guard them with. How many of you are in the military? Army? Anybody in the Army? Okay. I don't know about you. I spent about six years in the Army, and I couldn't hit that door with a pistol. <laughs> so this is what we subjected uh, these, these poor guards to. Uh, more importantly, the prisoners were not trained to be prisoners. Think about that. We talked a little bit more about that when we talked about Morgan's Raiders. But here was a situation where these people were thrown into this situation. My sergeant's over here in prison with me. He's telling me to do something. There's a guy with a gun over here telling me to do something. Prisoner? Gun. Prisoner? Gun. Um, you know, I'm here, by God and I, if I get food, I'm keeping it. And I don't care if I got two overcoats, I'm not giving one to you. That kind of attitude was not unusual. If you carry it to an extreme at places like Andersonville, if you look at the history of Andersonville, much of the problem of Andersonville were the Union soldiers. There were several thousand called the Raiders who raided their fellow prisoners. They convinced uh, Captain Wirtz to hold a trial. The Union soldiers held a trial and executed six of their fellow prisoners for the bestiality to themselves. Also in Andersonville, there was no rhyme or reason. You could never get the people together in a formation. If you look at the photos of Andersonville, it's just a hodgepodge. So these kinds of things uh, and the lack of preparation for the prisoners had an impact on, on loss of life. Lack of preparation for long-term incarceration. The Dix Hill Cartel was guided. Uh, the exchange of parole and exchange it was rather naive. It said all captives will be paroled within 10 days of capture. How practical is that? But that was used as a crust by General Mace, the Quartermaster General of the U.S. Army, who was responsible for prisons, and Colonel Hoffman, who was uh, the Commissar of Prisons, uh, to say, wait a minute, you want money to build something in that camp? You're not going to be here very long. Why should we spend money? Both of them were well-known skin flints. And this gave him an opportunity to be even skin flintier. <laughs> but uh, that was typical that because there was just a lot of preparation for that. High leadership turnover. Uh, no Camp Douglas, in two and a half years, had 12 different commanders and 13 command chains. And one guy came back twice. Uh, and ironically, there were two times when the two times when, when prisoners were exchanged. There were basically no prisoners there, or very few prisoners only in the hill. And in those times, the commanders became not colonels or generals, but captains. Young captains were suddenly in charge of them. Now, do you think they had much influence when there was a time to make improvements? Probably not. Uh, so this turnover, by the time one of the colonels had an idea of what needed to be done, he's gone. 
The next colonel is coming in and saying, I don't even know who I'm supposed to talk to or what's going on here. So Gabe told Miggs and Hoffman an opportunity to continue to defer. That leadership turnover was significant. Lack of natural immunity due to the rural environment of the Confederate soldier. Uh, Confederate soldier was a farmer. Very rarely were they with a group of human beings. Uh, and if you look at the statistics, diseases like measles were a serious problem because these men just didn't have that national immunity. Now suddenly they're in a major metropolitan area with 12,000 of their closest friends, uh, and you might have a problem with your lack of immunity. Uh, condition of prisoners uh, and the uh, diet change. A uh, diet change is kind of interesting because you went from a pork, corn environment in the South to a beef and bread, and really lousy beef, <laughs> in the Union. Uh, and doctors in those days didn't realize that that had an impact on your gastronomical you know, reaction. So there were a lot of gastro gastrointestinal problems because of that diet change. Condition of prisoners is a very significant one. And let me give you two examples. I mentioned, I mentioned uh, uh, Fort Donaldson. And correct me if I'm wrong on these dates. You guys know better than I do. If I remember correctly, February 16th, Fort Donaldson surrendered. Uh, General Grant said to the prisoners, you take anything you can carry except your weapons, I'll give you two days' rations. Put them on boats in the Cumberland River. Took part of them to Cairo, Illinois. The rest of them went to St. Louis. The first prisoners left on this roughly the sixth, late 16th, early 17th. First prisoners arrived in Camp Douglas on the 20th. A majority of them arrived about the 28th. After two days rations. The boats were unheated, and the trains that they rode on from both St. Louis and Chicago were basically cattle cars. So you can see the condition. And and it was acknowledged that they had been there almost a month before in terrible weather and were not properly dressed. They were dressed for the southern climb. So they ended up in Chicago. And in Chicago in, in February 1862, the average temperature was about 20, 25 degrees, according to the Chicago Tribune. Uh, so it was not, uh, not nice and warm. Then fast forward to uh, Franklin, Tennessee, where the last group of prisoners came from. They had a pitched battle at Franklin, and we know the devastation was there. Oh, by the way, they had walked from Atlanta to Franklin, but that's minor. Uh, they were captured in Franklin, marched to Nashville, and actually started sleeting and snowing as they were being marched across there. They were then put on, on a train to go to Louisville. Louisville, they were offloaded on the cattle cars, and some of the diaries say they were stuffed in there like cattle, taken to Chicago, and unfortunately, no excuse for this, spent almost half a day standing in snow waiting to be processed. Diarists from Franklin, a number of them said, you could trace the prisoners from Franklin to Nashville by the bloody footprints, most of the sheep. So you can imagine the conditions they must have been in. Uh, the cases of prisoners dying within 30 to 45 days of Camp Douglas were, were common. Uh, was that Camp Douglas' fault? Maybe they didn't have the medical care for them. Was it their total blame? I'm not sure. And finally, inadequate primitive medical care. Uh, this was before the dawn of reason and, and medicine. Uh, and uh, you know, we, it was 40 years or 25 years before the theory of, uh, of germs was uh, common. Uh, actually, it was about in the 1880s when uh, they started using carbolic acid on uh, amputations and reduced the mortality rate of amputations from 45% to 15%. But again, 20 years after the war. So the primitive nature of medical. This slide is busy, but I want to show it to you anyway. This uh, shows the uh, the death, positive death, uh, and 
You'll notice 70,000 cases were treated. And if you figure the number of people, obviously people were treated more than once. This statistic is pretty good if you want to compare prison camps, because these numbers were pretty consistent uh, throughout the Union's uh, Army. Uh, if you look at that, you see a lot of it was respiratory problems, a lot of it was uh, sanitation. Um, if you look at those the diseases, the one that sort of sticks out to me is scurvy. Scurvy could have been prevented, they knew how to prevent it. Uh, unfortunately, General Hoffman, the commissar of prison, for some reason, although it was on his approved list, refused to allow the sutlers to sell vegetables to the prisoners. And uh, for some reason, General Sweet, or Colonel Sweet, who was the commander at the time, had money in a prison fund but refused to spend it on uh, vegetables. Now you say, oh, look at only 35 died, no big deal. But I would submit that the 3,700 that got it, to look at the condition that scurvy leaves the body and likely died for the causes. Smallpox is an interesting one, and I think it's, it's interesting because it take, you have to look at it from a 19th century perspective. 1792, uh, a reasonable vaccination for smallpox was available. And it was used widely. Uh, in fact, sometimes forced on people. And I want to read you Mr. Burke, who I quoted before. Here's a Mr. Burke talks about immunization. This was in September 1864. Our regiment was vaccinated. And I washed mine off and squeezed it to keep it from taking. For I would rather run the risk of smallpox that have a sore that some of them have on their arms. Did you get smallpox? Get your arm cut off. So you have to sort of look at it. By the way, uh, Mr. Burke got smallpox. And if you want to know what happened, the book is available. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I think that's interesting because that gives you that sort of that 19th century perspective. They call it. Why not? He later was forced to be vaccinated a couple of times. Uh, but still, smallpox was a major problem. Wow, that's an interesting idea. My, I have a beautiful picture of the Confederate monument at uh, Oak Ridge Cemetery that somehow was missing. <laughs> uh, those, the prisoners who died at Camp Douglas uh, were initially buried at City Cemetery, which was the uh, northern, you know, southern end of what is now Lincoln Park. And if you know the uh, softball diamonds at the south end, that was Potter's Field. That was where they were buried. Uh, Lakeshore Drive obviously didn't exist, but the Lakeshore did right up there. And there were cases of bodies going out of City Cemetery, perhaps Confederates, and being fouling the intake valves at the crypts for a water source. Uh, in 1867, uh, in 1968, they were moved when the whole cemetery was being moved. Uh, I don't know how many were moved. Uh, the number of burials said by the <coughs> person who buried them from Camp Douglas had one number. The city had another number in the cemetery. The guy who disinterred them had a third number. And at Oakland Cemetery, they said, put them over there. They didn't care. Uh, I have been unable to reconcile with everything from certain bodies being shipped home, grave robbing, which was not unusual at the time. It's almost impossible to tell. There are 4,243 names uh, on the monument there. The monument says up to 6,000 buried there, as anybody suggests. But, there were more Confederates buried there than anywhere north of the Mason-Dixon line, another quote. <laughs> and ironically, that is also the uh, largest mass grave in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and how did Oakwood get them? Wasn't well, necessarily the low bidder, nobody else would take them. None of the city cemeteries, or famous city cemeteries, would accept them. 
Um, I can only find one soldier that didn't end up in Oakwood. His name was Theodore Hirsch of the Holmes Light Battery in Louisiana Artillery, who was Jewish and buried in the Hebrew Benevolent Society Cemetery. Ironically, his grave was subsequently lost. Uh, but he was the only one I could document that uh, didn't end up there. Uh, I want to talk about some people now because they're a lot more fun than the others. Let's start with Morgan's Raiders. <coughs> Don't know how many Morgan's Raiders were there because Morgan lied. Uh, he always underestimated, he always undercounted the number of people they had. He'd say, oh, I only have 15,000 people or whatever. I've heard uh, anywhere between uh, 2,000 and uh, 2,500 of the soldiers were in camp books, it's hard to tell. They're an interesting lot because they were absolutely despised by the guards. All they wanted to do was escape, cause trouble, not cooperate. They were just a pain in the butt. And they had fun, though. They had, uh, they had their, uh, their orchestra and their bands that they performed on. Uh, one, of the, one of the young men uh, also had a minstrel show. Uh, he was an interesting guy because he not only had a minstrel show, he sold an elixir uh, to the prisoners, and he was the sheriff, whatever the prisoners wanted to do anything. So this guy made that, he made out pretty well. Uh, for 25 cents American or five dollars Confederates, you could go to one of the barracks and uh, participate in one of their shows. They also published a newspaper, uh, my dad. Uh, the only copy of it is now at the, uh, the uh, Harold Washington Library. Unfortunately, for a number of years, it hung in the sun at the Chicago Cultural Center. And of the four pages, only two are readable. And it's this size. But it's an amazing piece of paper. It has some very interesting political comment. And in Block 37, you can get the best clay pipes anywhere. It's come to Block 37. Uh, but it's interesting to hear these guys think his themes. Now, it's also interesting, they arrived in mid-1863 when the Dix Hill Cartel, the exchange of prisoners, was suspended. And suspended by Abraham Lincoln. Suspended the exchange of prisoners because Jefferson Davis would only treat uh, captured African-American soldiers as escaped slaves. And Lincoln said, unless you treat them as prisoners of war, we will not exchange prisoners. Can you imagine the pressure on that man and what it meant to his soldiers who were destined to stay in prison camps? Anyway, they arrived just about the same time that that was suspended. So they knew they were going to be at Camp Douglas until they died, signed the oath of allegiance, or escaped. But they didn't want to die. They tried awfully hard to escape, and they were not going to sign the oath of allegiance. Drove the guards absolutely crazy. But when I remained with them, I did a very unscientific study of their mortality rate based on the, the names on the Confederate mound and what we think the number of prisoners were there. Their mortality rate was between 5 and 7% compared to 15 to 17 percent. Now why? I think part of it was they were younger, probably fit or fit. They also were captured in the summer, but they spent two winters in Camp Douglas. So not too bad. They were also, many of them were, how, were how homes were in areas controlled by the Union. And in that case, it was controlled by the Union, you could actually get care packages. You could get food, you could get money, you could get clothing. So to a certain extent, they had some advantages. They were what I call the haves. They were those haves who lived reasonably well. There was another group that sort of fit in there, the Masons, who uh, got special treatment. Uh, there were those who signed the oath of allegiance who were still working in the camp and got special privileges. Uh, and then there were the have-nots, who were the guys from Texas, Louisiana, who had no friends there. Buddies. Uh, 
Um, but these guys, I submit, to a certain extent, had a higher survival rate because of the way they acted. And fast forward to 1955, Dwight Eisenhower signed the Code of Conduct. This is how they expect their soldiers to act. Here's what the Code of Conduct says. I'm going to read it. I'm going to quote it. All means, you will use all means to resist. It's your duty to escape. You will not seek or accept favors. Never accept parole. Keep faith in fellow prisoners and maintain the chain of command. Everything Morgan traders did while they were there. Um, some other stories that are fun. Robert Anderson Bagby mentioned uh, was honored to transcribe his diary not long ago. Bagby was an interesting guy. He was from Missouri, uh, was captured, and became a nurse in the prison. He was a prison nurse. One of the things interesting, his diary, which was at the Museum of the Confederacy, is about 15 books. His diary, up until the time he was captured, was in pencil. When he became a nurse, he had access to ink. So his diary, the rest of the time, he thought was written in ink. Not sure what that means. Diaries are really a really cool thing about first person activity, but you have to realize diaries are one person's opinion. You know, one viewpoint. Uh, a lot of journals were written, like the Burke Journal, written in 1919. Uh, they're interesting that they have, you know, the frailty of age. I don't know about you people, but my fish have gotten a little bit longer. <laughs> and also, many of those journals were written, among other things, to justify a federal pension. So there was a little bit of a skewing of it. Newspapers are also interesting. Newspaper articles, of course, they represent you know the, the position of their publishers and so forth. But the perfect example is Chicago Tribune. Just about three days before prisoners were coming to Camp Douglas, he wrote there was an article in the paper that said there is no way prisoners are coming to Camp Douglas. They can't even keep track of a few Union soldiers. It's the dumbest thing we've ever heard of. What an absurd rumor! And a couple of days later, it said. Well, you know, if they do bring prisoners to Camp Douglas, because of the financial arrangements, it's much cheaper than here and there and there. So it probably would be not bad. And about two days later, it said 7,000 prisoners have arrived at Camp Douglas. <laughs> so they, you never know what they're going to say. But let's, let's go back to Bagby. And again, here's a prisoner. I want to read something that he said. He wrote this diary February 11, 1863. Both deaths were from pneumonia. It was enough to discourage the most considerate man to see how many deaths, to know the undertaker was taking from 12 to 20 death loads each day from the camp. Then he goes on to say, this never shook by faith, and I remained in good spirits and good health. One of the things that was common in the end of the war was this idea of signing the Oath of Allegiance. He signed the Oath of Allegiance and were from a border state or a state under control of the Union, you could go home. You could sign the Oath of Allegiance, you could join the Union Army. Actually, the Confederates preferred the Navy because there was less chance of running into their buddies. Or they would join a unit that was trying to go fight the Indians. Or you could sign the Oath of Allegiance and stay there as a, as a clerk or as a cook or somebody and have special privileges. Um, Bagby had a chance to sign it several times. But here again, this 19th century ideas. Here's what he said about it. He said, there was some, of the, some recruitment in the camp about taking the oath. A good many were taking it. I disagree myself. Taking the oath was a disgrace alone. Well, I was doing all right. Taking the oath was more than I could stand. I was much sorry to see Miller and Ronnie and George and Wes William, Milt, and Amos taking the oath, but I wouldn't question them. I felt lonesome having been left alone. I could not take the oath, for I thought more of my honor than I did my case. How could a man, how could they have confidence in a man who would take the oath? Honestly, they could not. There's a man who could have walked out of that prison. 
interesting. Uh, James Blanchard's another interesting prisoner. Hey, but you guys know another one. I like the guys who were hated by the guys. Uh, he wanted to escape. That's all I wanted to do was escape. In April 1963, he was caught sneaking away by the guards. Broadway. In May, he bribed his way out, was caught. Came back in. Later in May, he escaped again. And was one of these weird guys who got on the trolley, went downtown Chicago, went into the levee district of Chicago, got a snoop full of liquor. And I don't understand this. Here he, here's a drunk. Uh, probably dirty, probably not terribly well fed, dressed rather shabbily with a southern accent, and he wonders why he gets arrested for being an escape prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was interesting because many of the prisoners thought there was much more sympathy, southern sympathy in Chicago than it turned out to be, so it may not be too unusual. But uh, Blanchard finally was exchanged, and I think the guards cheered. Uh, John Miller, a saloon keeper, is another good one. He was a saloon keeper in Chicago. And I don't know how a saloon in Chicago in the 1860s would go broke, but this did. And he managed to stiff a bunch of his buddies. Well, he left, went down to the south, became an officer, a better officer, was captured, and ended up in Camp Douglas. His creditors found out he was there. <laughs> well, unfortunately, they couldn't couldn't get money out of him, but they spent a great deal of time harassing him. So they would come and literally harass John Miller. Uh, and I never did find out after the war whether he paid him back uh, or what happened to him. But he was not a happy boy. Well, talking about a prisoner who had all the things against him. Uh, the young man and his mother know this big story. Young man was very young, probably 16 or 17, went south in the year 1862, joined the army, um, got captured, sent back, sent to Camp Douglas. Mom found out he was here. So mom visited in the camp, and here's what she said. Oh dear boy, you have been the subject of many prayers, and you are not past praying for yet. The prison authorities immediately released him to mom. <laughs> Within Fife's Dog, this is a great story that I, I read from maybe four or five different prisoners in, in diaries and journals. The interesting thing was everybody knows about it, but nobody was involved. But they know the story. Well, the story goes like this. Lieutenant Fife was an officer of the guard. <clears throat> he had a dog, a little terrier. He was at the head of the camp, all over the camp, in the prison area, in the Union area. Just but he came up missing. So Lieutenant Fife wrote a note, and they had a little place in the in the prison compound to get, you know, put a note, a little bullet board. And then he said, ten dollar reward for returning my dog. Well, he went back a couple of days later, and under that a poem had been scrawled. And the poem went like this: For the want of bread, the dog is dead. For the want of meat, the dog is eat. Mm -hmm. that was the end. But nobody, nobody was involved in it, but they all heard it. <laughs> Lieutenant Huff, 14th Infantry. Uh, I want to just quickly read a something he said on April 3rd, wrote his diary, April 13th, 1865. April 13th, 1865. Here's what he wrote in his diary. Here's a prisoner writing this. Today everything is stir, for it is stated that Lincoln is assassinated. I believe it, for the Yankees assert it and their actions prove it. They are mad today and are doing all sorts of things to the boys, knocking them, beating them, and suffering the dungeon for saying they're glad of it. I'm almost afraid to say anything about it, for they are much enraged. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be a prisoner when the President of the United States was murdered? Finally, I want to talk to one of my favorite guys, a guy named McCopley. Uh, McCopley was the most colorful writer I've ever read about Camp Douglas. This guy, his writing is amazing. 
And he describes some guards. And I, I want to I read to you what he said. Well, the guards were interesting because there were some guards. Many of the prisoners said the guards were reasonable. Many of them were. But there were a group of them that were brutes, were just awful. We had an officer who was with them. And whenever they were on the grounds, everybody took off because they would shoot you, they would beat you. So Cockley described one of them. One of them was a, was a, uh, a guy by the name of, they called him Old Red O'Hara. Old Red, incidentally, later died in the saloon fight in Chicago. He was not, but I think he deserved it. But here's what, he, what Cockley said about him. He said, the large ill-shaped nose and two dull gray eyes placed in the midst of a pair of unsightly cheeks gave his countenance the most hideous and semi-comic experience and expression. Two ponderous ears stood out in bold relief, one on each side of his head, somewhat resembling the side lamps of a carriage. <laughs> Colorful. Another guy was uh, Captain Spoonable, who was the officer. And he described Spoonable in this way. He said, he was a medium stature, figured grotesque and ugly in the extreme. Features coarse, face resembling a well-grown artichoke. <laughs> Covered over, as it was, with large bubs. Hair stood straight up, were not saturated with grease and oil. Uh, that was a description of Captain Spoonable. Just some colorful stuff. Why was Camp Gun Douglas forgotten? I don't know. Was it? Was it reminder? Was it indifference? Fear of reprisal? Not important to Chicago in the 1860s. Maybe all of those, or some of those, the great Chicago fire certainly changed our priorities, didn't it? Uh, and then urban sprawl, as you know, Brownsville, where they are, was the epicenter of the black migration after World War I, and certainly was in the center of the development of the slums going into the, through the Depression. So a lot of things were happening. What's changed? I think there's a greater awareness of history. I'm absolutely thrilled to see a young man in the back there, because they're the people who are going to help remember this, not us old guys. I need to retain historic sites. A lot of people told me, don't ever get involved down there in Bronzeville. They want nothing to do with them, Confederates. Just the opposite. The people of Bronzeville said this is a part of our community's history and it must be preserved. The only people I had negative on were Draper and Freeman. <laughs> I think I could hopefully better understand some of the realistic of the conditions that were in existence during the war. The Civil War was an awful place. Civil War prisons were awful places. Uh, some were worse than others. Some of it could have been prevented. But a lot of it was really based on 19th century thought, uh, which makes it difficult to, uh, to criticize with 21st century hindsight. The educational importance of it. I know Dean and I have been working with uh, a lot of education in the schools, and uh, we're finding the acceptance and interest in that education is important. And community growth. A uh, little bit about Camp Douglas, and we'll get out, let's get out of here. One of our objectives is to create a museum on the site. Uh, we're very close to potentially a site at the old uh, Griffin Funeral Home, uh, which is at 3232 South Mitchell Drive, South Martin Drive. And what we want to do is reproduce one of the barracks. Uh, that the prisoners lived in as a museum. Uh, hopefully we'll, you know, negotiating things like this take a lot of time, but hopefully we'll get it done. We've done uh, archaeological digs, and, and one of the reasons we've done archaeological digs, one of our other goals is to have Camp Douglas, the area of Camp Douglas, listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. And it's an uphill battle, we're, we're doing some work with the state right now, uh, normally, those places listed on the register are physical, a building, a community, you know, this kind of thing. There's nothing there. But there are provisions if the site is of archaeological <coughs> significance. And that's one of the reasons we've been doing a lot of archaeological work. We've done 
six gigs now. Our first one was uh, over here where the uh, uh, headquarters was located. And we've done five in this location in the prison. Um, first thing we found was the, the headquarters. We think the foundation of the headquarters building. Uh, fun to ask the archaeologists, how do you know that? And their response was, well, it's what we thought it was. <laughs> One. Two, these stones were quarried in rock and uh, rock port, rock port, and that is where they were quarrying stones during the Civil War. And the uh, tool marks from Civil War. So they, we think it, it fits. Uh, but also, this is kind of fun. We found a little piece of pipe, and it's over there. It's only about an inch long. One side, as you can see, is stamped H-E-N, and if you turn it around to T-A-L. So H-E-N is the beginning of what was stamped on there, and E-A-L is the end. Uh, and it turns out, with some research, to be the Henderson Pipe Company of Montreal, Canada, who made pipes from 1846 to 1876. So it fits the time period. This is an example of, we are digging in the Pershing, John J. Pershing Magnet School, did I get it right this time? Uh, that's the school behind. We've done all of them, five gigs in, the, in their backyard. Absolutely wonderful time with the kids. Um, we have third graders out there digging with us, and we have scared the heck out of seventh graders. Ghost stories, right? <laughs> uh, and we last time we dug in October, we had over 70 volunteers, uh, both students, but anybody who wants to dig is welcome to join us. All you have to do is email me, my card's over there, email me, I'll put you on the list, and we're getting ready to do another gig. We have one prerequisite, you have to do it when you get dirty. That's it. Um, our big find was this B, this was the cap badge for a Kepi. It was the first, I believe, the first military artifacts found in Chicago in over 100 years. Uh, it was kind of an interesting story. The archaeologists and I were both gone. the end of the day, end of the day, we had two buckets to sit and we were done. And I got a call from the people who were doing the last work. He said, I'm going to send you a picture. Call me. He sent me a picture. I, this was, I think that he gave you the picture. He sent me a picture, and I called him back, and I only said one thing to him. Tell me it's not plastic. <laughs> and he said, no, it's not plastic. So we were able to confirm that this was something of the Union Army issue beginning in about 1863. So, obviously. This is another good uh, brown face reed pipe. We just thought it was just an old pipe we found there. And in doing some research with the Museum of the Confederates, we found this is the pipe of choice of the Confederate soldier. And the Museum of the Confederates said, based on what we look, what we're looking at, and where you found it, we believe it was owned by a Confederate soldier. It's also kind of cool because he said we have a bunch of these in our collection, but yours is nicer. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, we found some other things, more military. We found a military button. This is a small button, three-quarter inch. But it was typical of the button that would have gone on a cheap tunic. And these would have been the tunics they would have issued to the Confederate soldiers. So finding that size button would not be unusual. On the right, our rubber, rubber blanket grommets. We think we're still researching those, but the rubber blankets were common among both the Union and Confederate soldiers. Our last find were mini balls. Found three of them, 58 caliber mini balls. Uh, interestingly, they were found uh, with glass underneath them, which was significant to us because of the argument of what the western boundary was. That if that was just open ground, how did the glass get underneath a bunch of some mini balls? Notwithstanding, why are the mini balls there? We have no idea. Was it contraband that the Confederates threw out? Was it something a Union soldier had and discarded? Uh, sometimes Confederates would have something like that, and they would be, uh, they would be for art. They would carve them. So don't know, but uh, we know what they were. We found a lot of other stuff that is not military, but we believe belongs to the camp. Earthware, crossword buttons, which were typical of the buttons worn in the younger garments uh, during the Civil War, and glass and nails. When they tore Camp Douglas down, we don't think they cleaned up very well. So when we find a bunch of window glass and nails, we're happy. Kind of strange, by the way. Uh, well, what about the questions? Oh, let's get to them. First one is false. 
Only five acres and not very much even on camp property. Location southern end of the city, falls. It was outside the city. Uh, actually, the city limits went to 35th Street in 1863, so halfway through it ended up in the city. Uh, in terms of the largest union prison camp, falls, it was really third to Point Lookout and uh, Port Delaware. Eight different commanders in the said we had 12. Highest death rate, that's falls, uh, 15 to 17 percent, depending how many prisoners we had, and 24 percent in Elmira. Uh, second only to Gettysburg, that's false, we're number one. <laughs> Uh, Oakwood Cemetery was not the low bidder, nobody else would take them. Uh, Anderson Dell, I didn't talk about this, but this is something I, I'd like to get in. Anderson, how many said that was true? Okay, how many said it was false? How many didn't care? <laughs> well, actually, Andersonville was open 14 months. And actually, it was only about nine months that they had prisoners. After about the ninth month, there were only about 200 prisoners there. So comparing Andersonville to, to uh, any other prison camp is almost impossible to do. Camp Douglas was open for two and a half years. Dix Hill Cartel was suspended by, by Grant. It was not. It was actually Lincoln. Grant was, was blamed by many of the lost cause advocates. <coughs> I submit Grant was a, was, a, was a major general in the Western Theater at that time, had some influence over Lincoln, but not that much. Uh, I think that was a decision made by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, more Americans, and this is a statistic that blew my mind when I first saw it, 430,000 Americans were in prison during the Civil War. Between that time and Vietnam, 142,000 only. So you can see the magnitude of the problem that was going on 150 years ago. Uh, and oh, by the way, you know, you know, it's not quite as bad, not the numbers aren't so much, but gee, who, uh, who came up with waterboarding? Who came up with Abu Ghraib? You know, be careful on how much you criticize people 150 years ago for perhaps the treatment of food. Um, more information. If you like more information, I strongly recommend Ted Karamansky's book. Uh, probably the best book rather on the flag on Chicago and the Civil War. Without question, the best book on Camp Douglas is written by a terrible buddy in the game of color. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they are available. Uh, and all the proceeds mm -hmm. from our, my book go to the Camp Douglas Restoration Foundation. It's available here, it's available on the website, it's also available on Amazon. But Amazon, we make about a buck, and buy it from us, we make about ten bucks, so it's a little, a little, a little more attractive. But uh, all that's left there is uh, a marker that was put up last year. I think many of you, some of you certainly attended that. Uh, that dedication, the first official desert recognition of the camp. Uh, by, we did that along with the uh, State of Illinois Historical Society. We're very proud of that, uh, that plaque. One of our board members wrote about it on that too. Uh, that's our website. Um, you know, I, I can't thank you enough for letting me come before you and uh, hopefully. Enlighten you a little bit, hopefully entertain you a little. Uh, but I'm very, very proud to be here, very pleased to be here. Can't thank you enough. I'll be happy to answer questions. <laughs> Until I get thrown out here. Yes, sir. Uh, at Oak West Cemetery, there's some unknown guards in Camp Douglas Cemetery. Yes. Uh, nobody knows for sure. Just the question was there are some U.S. graves buried near the Confederate Mount. Those were bodies that were dressed in Union garb that were 
removed from the smallpox. There were 600, people, 600 smallpox victims were buried near Camp Douglas. Those were among that, and they were just union identified. They didn't have anything more than that. The record can you move up? We got another question. Not to my knowledge. The only that asked the question was: Was there any movement to segregate prisoners based on uh, performance or on the behavior? The only the only distinction were officers. Most of the officers who moved to Johnson Island. Sandusky, Ohio, although some stayed at Camp Douglas. I don't know why, but there were all three Camp Douglas. But not, not the other. Yes. Was there any realistic attempt at a mass breakup? Uh, the conspiracy of 1864? Yeah. Uh, during the Democratic convention and the election? Um, I think the Confederates would have liked to have something happen. Uh, the Sons of Liberty, who were going to help them break everyone out, Promised thousands of fighters to came up with 25. <laughs> my my opinion that yeah they wanted to, I also think Colonel Sweet, who was the commander of the camp at the time, was very interested. He was he was a self promoter. He was very interested in his image after the war, and I think he milked that to a maximum. Uh, I think there was some conspiracy there, but I think it was doomed from the day it started. And actually, Colonel Sweet, I've got to tell this quick story about Colonel Sweet, because he did get a legacy, a very important legacy, which is known, most people don't know about. He was, uh, what was it, a while? Lombard. He ended up uh, organizing, he was one of the people who organized going to Lombard. And he took one word out of the chart, one word, he really got removed. And that word was uh, men, because in the voting section it said all citizens will vote. So first, women suffer in Lombard. It was sweet. Anyway, you had a question. Yes, uh, you, you know there's this five acre park where the Douglas Memorial is. Yeah. And, and also there was the area where the first University of Chicago was located. Correct. How do those two fit in with Camp Douglas? Uh, Camp Douglas was north of there. The University of Chicago was directly south at about Rhodes Avenue, which was about a fourth of the way in. In fact, I was showing that slideshow. If you get to the slide of the University of Chicago that was in there, if you look, through the trees, you see the smallpox hospital. It was just west of the University of Chicago. And Douglas's tomb is at 35th Street, so it's a little bit uh, south. And across the street from Douglas' tomb, of course, it's a soldier's home, which is the only building that I'm aware of remaining that was built specifically for the Civil War, which was built as a convalescent home for Union soldiers. But it's not adjacent to. No, there are about two blocks apart. Yes, sir. What about issues involving prisoners? You never heard much about shoes. Did the U.S. government issue shoes to the prisoners? Uh, I, I read some of them issuing shoes. I have, and also at the end of the war, there was there was a time when the Union allowed uh, cotton to come through the blockade, was sold. And it was sold for the purpose of buying clothing and providing clothing for prisoners, for Confederate prisoners. And I, in fact, I've seen some of the manifests of what was delivered to Camp Douglas, and shoes were included. Uh, but I, you know, I don't know if it was uh, if you had a, you know, a Sunday pair. Or, you know, I don't think you did. Yes, ma'am. Were there people that were in Chicago that were uh, feeling sorry for these prisoners? And would come and bring things to them. Yeah, and, 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 yeah in the beginning, uh, a lot of the women provided uh, provided uh, some clothing, provided bedding, and so forth for the prisoners. Uh, and I find that was a very it's an interesting circumstance. It wasn't Chicago alone, uh, and 
had seen that the 19th century woman, uh, women, were interested in the welfare of human beings. And they sort of, you know, these are these are human beings and we're not going to let them. So that was common. It was also, it was also a, uh, it was, it was a lot of, people used to go down by the, uh, by the omnibus and they had a tower for a nickel. You'd walk the tower and look at the stations. And so people would go down there and have fun. In line with that, you had the Sanitary Commission, which was a really big deal, which was mostly spurred because people heard about the conditions in the Union yeah. prison camp. And but did some of some of the product of the Sanitary Commissions go to the prison? Well, well certainly, their, certainly their inspections did, because they inspected the prisons. Uh, and that's another interesting thing. Women ran the Sanitary Commission. Men were all the officers and didn't do a damn thing. <laughs> Very serious. The women did all the work, but the guys did a lot of those. But yeah, there was certainly a benefit from the sanitary commissions to the prisons. Any other questions? <laughs>